myself and the panel in the session today. Um, just to talk about logistics, what we'll do is about 10 to 15 minute, uh, we'll do introductions, talk about the session, 10 to 15 minute presentations from each of us, just to sort of set the stage on our background, who we are, what company we're with, and um, you know, what uh, feedback we have just to anticipate the, the, the Q&A on, on project approaches. I can sort of feed the questions. We definitely encourage questions. I, I have some written here, um, you know, if we need to still fire a little bit. There's a microphone in the, in the third row um, on the uh, right side of the, of the room. Um, so uh, welcome you to, to pass the microphone around or, or step up to it if you'd like to, if you'd like to, to speak. I, I may also you know, want to um, uh, hear and rephrase what you're saying if you don't end up using the microphone just to, just to make sure we, we capture everything. So does that sound good for logistics? Does that sound fun, engaging, all, all, all the good stuff? Okay, wonderful. So uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Mark Godin. I'm the CEO of Vim Designs. Um, I'll, I'll get into uh, what Vim Designs is uh, during the presentation, uh, 3D modeling as a service and laser scanning, all that fun stuff. Uh, we also have Dustin Williams uh, here closest to me. He's the CEO and founder of Flywheel AEC, uh, a civil Vim uh, services company. Um, then we have Tim Riffenberg, uh, Vim manager at Delphi Beatty. And we have Kurt Johnson, uh, civil design lead and Vim manager at Kiwit. And then in this session, uh, we're going to be using BIM for a construction project that has many benefits, uh, but how best can you apply BIM to a project without adding more time or complexity to a project? We'll hear from leaders in the construction and architects uh, space as they describe their approaches to BIM and how it has transformed their AEC workflows. Uh, as I mentioned before, the session format includes brief presentations followed by a moderated panel discussion and audience Q&A. Um, so we'll start, with, uh, we'll start with my presentation uh, and then uh, we'll move on to, um, to, to Dustin and then, uh, and then Tim and then Kurt. So, uh, so just a, a little bit about Vim Designs Incorporated and myself. I'm, uh, I spent 10 years in Silicon Valley. I was a, I have a master's in electrical engineering and then I moved into the tech space. Uh, so I actually went to University of Florida, which is represented here on the expo floor, which is really fun. Yeah, go Gators. Uh, I was very excited to see them. Uh, and uh, worked for Cisco Systems and, and um, startups and, uh, and uh, network management, product management, um, uh, strategy and planning, mergers and acquisitions, uh, and then CXO roles for different startups. I ended up acquiring uh, this company when it was just three people, and in the past four years, we've grown into a nationwide company of 54 employees working remotely, and, and we only plan on growing and, and expanding from there. Um, so that all happened between 2018 and today. So as I mentioned before, we are, uh, we are um, a, a domestic leader dedicated to um, a diverse, inclusive workplace and culture. Um, it's one of our core values. We are um, the only certified, federally recognized minority-owned business that's signatory with 26 unions in North America. We believe in using, uh, working with union trade journeymen to do the LOD 400 modeling, for, for those that understand um, that LOD phrase. And um, we provide, provide turnkey MEPF uh, design and detailing solutions to contractors uh, that cost-effectively expand their virtual design and construction capabilities. Uh, so we provide staff augmentation and lump sum services to contractors uh, of all shapes and sizes. Some notable projects is um, we've worked out in the semiconductor industry, um, most recently in Phoenix, but other areas of the country as well. Um, we've worked commercial with Google Marketplace uh, and other many other commercial projects. These are just some notable ones. Uh, residential, like the Franklin Lenora Tower in Seattle. Uh, we've worked out at the Sports Center in Arlington, Texas. The largest, um, largest student housing um, at the time um, campus, UC Davis West Village for education, um, casinos, uh, like Casino Morongo, hospitality and healthcare, many, many hospitals. So um, we have a very diverse team that can, that can uh, do LOD 400 design uh, for all, all types of industries. So our core services would be uh, engineering design build, um, MEPF, um, BIM and virtual design. We can do pre-construction consulting, uh, owner, uh, owner's management, like this, um, coordination, we can do coordination, database management, and uh, 3D reality capture laser scanning, um, which is using many of the products that we see at the conference here today. So um, that's a little bit about Vim Designs. Um, to transition to the core topic of um, how, you know, leading ways to, to lead a, pro uh, a project or a successful project, um, just have some bullet points and then some notes that I want to share. So um, uh, one is, um, there are, you know, our observations, just to talk about observations over the last three or four years of uh, you know, working in this space, um, there are pain points of the contract and negotiation management. So what can we all do to simplify, uh, simplify that process together? Um, how can, uh, my analogy that I like to use is we're all um, uh, 
uh, the way it's currently structured, the contract structure is currently there, is that we are all on our own rowboats or our own canoes going down the same river, down the same stream, uh, but we have different coxswains. We have different people yelling the directions at us, and so we're kind of going like this all throughout the all throughout the river. Uh, so what can we do uh, holistically, and how can we all organize together to have a common con con um, contract, a common legal structure that we work under the general contractor? So uh, we just have one coxswain uh, speaking to us. Um, there's also a knowledge gap in the industry, right? There's um, there's folks that have worked out in the field and that are trained on how to do that. There's folks that know AutoCAD. And then there's the gap in between, um, and then there's the, and then there's the whole rest of the, the world and the need, which is combining those needs and the folks that aren't uh, that don't have the field experience or the CAD experience. Um, there could be mixed reality integrated in the QC processes. We've heard a lot about mixed reality, AR, VR, and the mixed version of that in the, at this conference. Uh, and there could be managed efficiencies that bring savings for owners and GCs investments into BIM, and that's not that's not the, the, the guaranteed savings that you would get for you utilizing BIM, as we all know, we've all been educated on. Um, but you can also bring more uh, efficiency into that process. How do you better manage that entire process to bring greater savings? Because if there's delays on the BIM side, there's delays on the construction side. Uh, and then there could be reduced litigation by using BIM and, and uh, keeping very careful documentation, keeping versions of the BIM model, scanning the job site as, it ha as it's uh, being built. Um, all of this documentation that you're using to build the actual building can be um, stored and saved later, not only for asset management and facilities management, um, as has been discussed at the conference, but also um, uh, litigation management as well. Uh, so the role that's uh, played by owners and GCs, how can owners and GCs help? I know that's not the, the audience that we have today, uh, but um, they can help and we can encourage them to help us um, support and empower the BIM process from day one. So the better and the more we educate the general contractor and the owner about how the BIM process is and how much they should embed that into the project and program plan, as gatekeepers and blockers um, is very critical. Um, we should all utilize the BIM model early and often to, to convey feedback. So let's get in front of the owner, let's get in front of the GC and show them what's happening on a very uh, active and, and consistent basis so that they can share um, their um, you know, their feedback rather than get to the end of the you know the IFF stage or the sign-off stage and then there's feedback and changes or of course get to construction and there's changes in feedback because the owner didn't see the flight through the model. Uh, very important uh, for um, all stages, the architect, the engineer, the, the designers like us, to collaborate with the, the LOD 400 model in mind. The LOD 400 model, for those who might not be familiar, is effectively the, the constructible model. What, what would be uh, most realistic to construct this in real, in real space? Uh, and then enforce uh, a, a well-specified BIM execution plan with both the technical and business program management. So it's not just the BIM execution plan and signing that document, which is typically 60 pages that nobody reads. It's how you manage and enforce the BIM execution plan throughout the entire life cycle of that, of that project. Um, what can we all do to help make sure that projects are more efficient? Uh, we can make sure that we ensure clarity of expectations of the project start. Um, that's critical. So to understand what your needs are and to have those needs met before the project start. We all are faced with the concrete pour date, right? I think we can all relate to, we have to hit that date no matter what. But if our, if our needs aren't met, then we're stuck at the six months prior to concrete start, then we're starting behind the curve. And, and eventually that concrete pour date will get affected because we don't have our needs met on day one and we're running behind day one. We want to negotiate and execute contract and payment terms before BIM kick off. Same reason, your, your payments could be delayed. Uh, your, your terms aren't clearly understood. Who's liable, who's responsible? You're happy with the project and you don't understand these things. And you're, you're putting more and more risk onto your individual business for that. We want to make sure that all project materials, submittals, material matrix, BIM execution plan, um, standards were all set prior to kickoff. In fact, the owner, we would hope, I, I would hope that the owner would enforce that all of these things are understood. Someday we can get them to that point where, hey, this job does not start, this BIM kickoff does not start, so we actually understand everything we need to start that job. Um, we want to bring meeting excellence to coordination meetings. Um, I'm sure we've all been a part of meetings where there's 20 people in that meeting, it's run for four hours, and maybe there's about 30 minutes of productivity in that meeting. That's 20, hours, that's, that's 20 people times, times four hours, that's 80 hours that was just billed to the owner that was highly inefficient, uh, minus the half hour last point. So we want to be able to bring very strong meeting, um, um, meeting excellence to coordination meetings. Uh, I am running out of time, but I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards about how we can run uh, excellent meetings. Um, we've done a lot of internal work within our company to make sure we run as efficient as possible meetings. Setting agendas, um, having a timekeeper, having a note taker, making sure there's actions after, for example. Um, and then, and then uh, again, working very closely with the owner to seek that feedback and utilize um, 
the technology that we all know so well, like now is where it's AR and VR. Let's not just use that in our silos, break right down of our silos and bring that up to the owner. So thank you so much for allowing me to give that, um, that overview of BIM design. Dustin, if you will. Thank you, sir. Trade 
contractors that we're partners with. So they have maybe like a BIM manager, and then we're the, we, are, we extend their BIM team. And we do the modeling, we, we co-attend meetings, and do the constructability review. We have a lot of civil design experience, so we can, we can see a project from the designer standpoint, and then also from the construction standpoint. And so we try to submit really helpful RFIs, things like that so that we can um, expedite the process. So our bid process is really, I think um, what Mark is saying about really having an excellent plan is really all this is trying to say. We have a couple of step process. If it's a, if it's a large BIM coordination type project, we're identifying any potential, you know, is it a very thick schedule, or is it a, a large footprint where we want to um, monitor the progress over time? Um, does the civil work need to get done before, or you know, between demolition and before the building starts going up? Uh, is there, you know, not very much room for logistics within the uh, outside the building footprint in the property line. Those are all things that uh, contribute to um, more difficult civil type work. And then we, we, we typically will support the project. Like we're, we're not just developing a BIM implementation plan. We will help but give feedback. Oftentimes the BIM implementation plan that's given to us doesn't really address civil very well. Um, it is really just a copy and paste of uh, uh, architectural, usually. So we get feedback on that. Things that make factual you know, sense as far as level of development and accuracy uh, for the civil scopes of work. And then we work with the client, try to over communicate as much as possible because they are usually the ones attending those coordination <coughs> meetings. And, and just keeping them in the loop because they're, you know, as soon as we're done, especially in large projects, we're finishing coordination and they're going out and building it very, very shortly after. So they're usually first on the ground. So just real quick, I think during our panel discussion, we'll dive into this stuff much more quickly, or in much more in depth, but the typical process for an actual application would be creating a coordination model from the design documentation then reviewing that model for constructability, which we do on our end, and then also with our trade contractor will we'll do, and then we'll bring our minds together on that. And then um, we'll attend those meetings either by ourselves or, or with the superintendent or, or some decision maker. That's usually the best approach. Uh, when they understand them, they know how they're gonna build the project. They are the ones that really need to attend those meetings with us. We just facilitate. And then we update the coordination model with construct that constructability type of feedback. Um, once everything at the coordination is done, we are exporting the geometry for the survey layout team. And, and then we'll round trip, they'll get their as-built documentation, give it to us, and then we'll create typically an as-built model of uh, what was constructed. <coughs> Primarily, we're doing civil BIM work, but we're all, we also do a lot of reality capture. Um, and we can go into this more, but I'm seeing a lot more projects, especially the, the larger um, and, and more um, coordination focused projects, utilizing reality capture in a bunch of different ways. Um, a little less laser scanning than it used to be, I think because of the advancements in like the drone technology. Um, the resolution has gotten a lot higher. We're now using LiDAR, so there's a lot more opportunities for drones to take, take over some of the double work instead of a slow, what well, can be a slower process, but it definitely has its place with the laser scanners. So then typical deliverables are usually ortho mosaics, point clouds, meshes, video, 360 photos are very commonly used now, and just there's still photos, but every one of those has a place and with a different, usually like different pro 
project stakeholders will rely on a different one of those. Uh, I think we talked before about a few commonly used uh, collaboration tools that people are using now. Um, I'll just touch on them and we can go into more detail later. The, the blue icons, Plannerly, is really helping your BIM execution plan uh, stay current, and then you can also round trip. Uh, you can add your schedule to it and keep people on on schedule, keeping them accountable at the coordination phase. Everyone's pretty much uh, familiar with Procore and Autodesk as far as like a common data environment. I, I'm I'm seeing at least on the big projects that Autodesk and Procore are being used at, on the same project for different uses. Um, Revisto personal favorite. It can be a common data environment, but it, it's really um, just getting everybody on the same page and, and doing a lot of flash, now flash detection and then issue tracking or flash tracking. And join is similar, I would say, to Plannerly. Join is pre-construction software. They start all the way at the estimation phase. And then Robot Optics is another company that I'm involved with. And that's uh, collaboration software for reality capture. As I touched on, I just want to give a quick shout out. We're also, I'm also going to be um, giving a US IBD presentation tomorrow at the same time. And we're going to be talking about and hopefully getting lots of feedback from owners and contractors and everyone involved with Basically, just a simple decision-making guide, not a guide that tells you what to use, but how to think about what tools you want to use for reality capture. There's a lot more options than there used to be, and so just thinking through it very quickly, it should be a really good resource for everyone. So I really took a hierarchy to the whole thing and said, you know, 
BIM has always been this, uh, like, do you guys do BIM? Do you do a checkbox? Um, I really asked them, like, what's your BIM culture? What's, what do your field guys think about BIM? What do your superintendents think about BIM? That's more important, because I want to know, if we're going to go down this path, if we're not bought in from all those out in the field, as well as leadership, this is a waste of time. Um, so really, it is, I took it to a three-peg approach. Um, so we have really three groups now. Uh, we have more with services. This will be like the DD stuff. This is going to be pursued animations that Bellcore used to do a lot of. Um, and really, like we also do modeling for subs. Um, a good thing about Georgia specifically is we're the only state that does layout. We do have a group in Washington, D.C. that handles the layout. But every region operates differently. They have different subs, different architects, different owners. So really, Georgia, as long as I've been there, the caliber of our subs have always been lower. They just don't have the caliber that a lot of your groups do. Um, and maybe it's because of schooling, or maybe it's just because of the industry down there wasn't really a buildable area for the last 30 years. But we all know that everything's booming. So now we have a lot of influx of new projects. But moral stories is, I first asked, how do we support them? How do we pay for it? Right? That's where it all starts. Because if we don't control the money, how do I get new equipment? How do I get new personnel? And they didn't really know. So, well, we just know it's an extra percentage on our job. So, well, you know, we do $5 million jobs and we do $200 million jobs. Where does that money even go? So, moral of the story is we're really pushing field solutions because we were having a legacy group of our layout team. Great, great old school mentality like a surveyor, real life of surveyor. Um, but he's using new technology. So, he's actually doing twice the work than our coordinators were doing. If he's drawing edge of slab and I'm drawing edge of slab, why are we doing double the work? So we made the task of we're going to own layout. It's only because of we are lacking the personnel, the detailers in house, to do such process. But I looked at the dollars and cents of what our field team provides. Because we do a lot of self-performed layout for you know, our concrete crews, but even our plumbers will do a lot of their layout too. Um, but when we do later scanning and our as builds, um, you know, for the owner side, we have a lot of revenue that's being generated. So that's why we're really promoting the field solutions group. Um, so yeah, this is really fun because you know I just I, I, pre I presented this to our leadership because a lot of them didn't know what I did. They said we love Ben. I really don't have a clue of what he did. Um, so they always would say like you know Ben modeling, and I said well. If you really want to take on this task of where we're going, let's have a conversation of where do you think we'll be 100 years from now? And they're like, oh, well, they're replaced by robots. Absolutely. But like, okay, so you know we're all going to be replaced by robots. What are you doing now to like offset that? And you have no clue. Like, we got to do projects now. We got to do this. We gotta, but that's, we're just being reactive. We're never going to get ahead of the curve if we really start to think about what our business is going to look like. In the next hundred years. Um, and that's why I just showed this map of, you know, the beginning when you know big folks were out there, they were always just modeling. And really FN started to evolve and there's some other tools and right around like the 2008 to 2020 right now, you know, later scanners and obviously the drones have been a huge win. But now we do so much more than just modeling. Um, but it's a big task because if you go to a company that doesn't have understanding all these other pieces, they're just so far behind might not ever catch up. Um, so like charts, um, if you look at, because I was, a, you know, 2008, and like everyone else, we all got let go on the design side. Um, and if you look at the adoption rate of why BIM went through the roof, it really was a reaction to the economy. The GCs, especially architects, they held on to their BIM folks because they knew that was the evolution where they needed to go. Um, so at that time, a lot of the pursuit that we go after, a lot of those jobs were government jobs. And we were always using BIM as a, a leg up over our competition. Well, that's not really the case anymore. But now we have to do, what are we doing different? It's more about our BIM culture. What tools are in our arsenal that we're going to use? So if you really look at, okay, the owners have sort of been, you know, lagging behind a little bit. What's interesting in the land market, 
Uh, I'm from Chicago originally. Um, there's a lot of owners in Chicago who are actually moving to the southeast because everyone's just building down there. But they're actually upping the game of our owners, understanding that there's this, there's this new BIM culture they haven't seen before. So now we're actually getting some owners out there that are very educated on BIM that we've never had before. And they're really making an impact on our market, which has been pretty good. Um, yes, this is the JP Knowledge. So if you just look at like Balfour Bay, you know, okay, so Ben, what do you do? So probably about 40 to 50 percent of its coordination, 30 to 20 percent is going to be field layout tech support, uh, about 20 in pursuit and other tech stuff. Uh, but JP Knowledge did, you know, this is a survey of all GCs really, and there's still a 68, 60 percent of most GCs just focus on coordination as their main goal. Well, that's great, but reality is coordination should be a lot less. It should be about 20, maybe 30%. There should be other tools out there or processes they should be implementing um, as well. And that's to say, like, um, let me go to this. Ah, so where are we going, right? So I'm a really big precedent of we have to outsource a lot of our services because one is it's expensive. It's very hard to find someone who's really knowledgeable, that has a lot of experience, doesn't want to run the department. Um, and so there's a lot of, you know, these projects are very short. In Belfort, I'm always being reactive now. And I just don't have the time to pick the drawings and remodel. Just, it's just too late. So we have to outsource a lot of our processes just because we don't have the labor market on the BIM side. It could take two to three years for us to find a really qualified BIM person to really implement into our company. Um, but if you look at 2008 when the recession happened, you know, housing prices went up, but also lumber, steel, and labor were tracking up as well. And if you look at the historical chart of today, obviously materials are through the roof, but it's very aligned with 2008. So if we were just, and I just tell folks that, if construction is growing at 3.5% every year, I told my leadership group, 10 years from now, that's a 30% increase in projects that we're going to do no matter what. And we're still only one or two BIM folks. That's got to change. We have to have, by 10 years, almost double the size of the department just to stay up with that small 3%. But in Georgia, uniquely, our subs, they just don't have that caliber. So we are actually being consumed even more on our time. So we're probably talking talk about 20, 30 people in about the next 10 years, just keeping up with the curve. Uh, right now we're about five people. Uh, like I said, if you look at the difference too, 40% in the increased labor has changed. Uh, and that's just a general rule from there to now. Uh, so bins gonna get more expensive, but the only way we're going to offset that cost is we need to create new tools, like new AI or be more efficient in our data management tools. More importantly, uh, we have to really set our guidelines of what BIM folks do. That's really hard because we get thrown into situations that we really shouldn't be there. My time should be spent on figuring out how do we implement BIM early on. And that's something that they really have not grasped on. Um, but I have a new job that I'm starting now that we're starting over. I'm, I'm actually working on pre-con. We're doing a, uh, like a, a scorecard for our layout teams. Um, and actually, we start putting some real BIM dollars in there really early on that they never ever did before. Uh, this is what I was just telling them that if you look at 2008 to 2025, you know, our field solutions group, we have an outdated laser scanner. But we have a new robot. Um, this, you know, Dr. E. Carlson is our tool for civil. Um, but reality is, if you look at the whole industry, we're almost 10 years behind. And the way we pick up next year, we're still going to be 10 years behind. Um, and I always tell them that in 2025, we're going to still be 10 years behind, even if we change the curve now. So that's something that I've been really brought on to offset that curve. Well, thank you so much, Tim. Thank you, sir. Awesome. Let's have, uh, let's have Kirk come on up. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everybody. Hope everybody's awake. Uh, my name is Kirk Johnson. I'm with Keywith. Uh, we're a construction and engineering firm uh, based out of Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, we do have offices and construction offices all around the country. Uh, we 
Mexico and Canada now too. Um, kind of geared my presentation towards my experience at Kiwit. Um, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about our company because I can take up my whole time with a lot of up here. So, um, so my background, I started a lot longer than I care to admit, but I started at uh, Black Beach doing civil design and we kind of pioneered a lot of the 3D work that we did there for uh, highways, bridges, and things like that, doing a lot of animations. Um, kind of built that into a career doing uh, a lot of 3D work and kind of worked into BIM services before I came to Kiwit. Uh, so when I came on with Kiwit, um, we still perform a lot of our construction. So a lot of our designs, uh, where I'm based out of Kansas City, you know, we're power plants, uh, power generation, solar, uh, things like that. Uh, our office here in Denver is all based uh, with infrastructure, so highways and bridges. Uh, a lot of the services that we do, I, I like to say that Kiwit already, they already had the, the tools for them in place, but they didn't really call it them. And then here recently, they've had a lot of clients that part of that, that one line of the contract says we want a BIM model, and a lot of our guys are like to be able to do that at the end, and you know, we were hand over, uh, didn't really put much thought into it. Uh, but when I started, I saw a lot of problems with that, that uh, kind of like Tim mentioned, you're going to be a few years behind the eight ball if you don't catch up now, and get that stuff implemented, get it rolling uh, before then. So a lot of my BIM experience was uh, started before Kiwit, uh, since I've been here. Um, We've tried to kind of uh, grow that group um, and not really have separate people that are just in services, but we, we took people that are already doing that in other districts. Um, some of the leads, the VDC managers, things like that, kind of morph them into a group that uh, we're more or less a resource for them services. So when we have a contract that needs a bit execution plan, they know they have one spot in Cuba they can go to to get that bit execution plan to make sure it's tailored to the project. Uh, depending on what districts it's with, which disciplines are involved, things like that. Um, some of the questions that, that management would ask me as, as we're going through this whole process is kind of how I base my presentation on. Um, I'm guessing a lot, of, especially like with you guys, the, your experience, you're getting a lot of these questions too when, when you're starting up uh, them services. Um, a lot of it's based, again, on our client contractual obligations that we have. You know, as Ben's mentioned in the contract, it's, it means nothing to a lot of our construction folks, but a lot of our engineers and stuff are like, okay, we need this, uh, but what is it? So we tried to, tried to kind of uh, expand on that. Um, with all the different districts that QMIT works, um, there's not a whole lot of overlap, but there are, there are some, uh, I want to say, backgrounds that the, each of the districts kind of mimics. Um, and you can imagine having 53 different districts doing 53 different things, that's a lot of variables that are, that are in play. Uh, so what we try to do is just maybe try and get that a little more coordinated so that you're, it looks like one company instead of 53 different companies doing the same project. Um, subject matter consolidation, that was one thing that uh, we have models, we have tons of data in these models. Our construction guys were using just maybe a tenth of that data. Um, since I want to say probably the last three years, we've had a, we've fired a lot of data analytics people uh, that have gone through these models, gone through our processes, uh, found improvements, found cost savings, found, I mean, you name it, they've, they've done that. And that's all based on the data we already had. So that was one of the things that we really wanted to help promote. Uh, to make, make more money for the company, obviously, but for also just to help our, our whole coordination effort. Um, product consistency is a big one. Uh, we look down different districts. Uh, some of our more uh, heavily construction districts, they, their product consistency, they would have a model that was basically a building. It was like, here's the pad, and it's right there. Um, some of our other ones, like our power plants, they are down to a millimeter, where that foundation needs to go, where all the stuff that was coming up, things like that. So we really need to have you know, high, high product consistency, um, a lot more data management, a lot of security involved. Again, I kind of reiterated on the who is our BIM services group. Uh, we don't have you know, one BIM manager. We don't have one person that's, that's really, you know, that makes up this one group. We kind of like to incorporate input from a lot of our engineers, our estimators, all the way down to our clients. And what I mean by that is we'll have, we'll have uh, clients that ask for BIM, 
And a lot of them will ask that question. They have no idea what they're asking for. They're thinking it's a rep off or something like that. Um, so we like to bring our clients in from day one, explain to them how we do our process, what tools we use to create those models, and basically give them a you know, kind of a roadmap of the model they're going to get, the data they're going to have in their hands. Uh, there are so many clients that they'll walk out of our first coordination meeting with their eyes wide open thinking, I had no idea that this you know, facilities management model was going to have this much data in it. And they're actually like wringing their hands for construction to finish because they know they're going to have this model. They're going to have more data than they care to deal with. But it's also something that they have in their pocket for the next project, the next phase that they, they have. Um, and so we really opened a lot of eyes bringing a lot of those people in. Uh, even same thing with subcontractors. I know Tim mentioned a lot of the uh, subcontractors don't have a lot of that experience. But by bringing those subcontractors into those meetings and, and talking with them and kind of helping them kind of coach them where they need to go with this stuff, a lot of them are documented a little more handily than they would you know, even probably five years ago. So our BIM services group, um, obviously with the coordination and compliance, and we're also involved with training. Uh, we've got, I think there's close to 20 people now that we've sent through the certified uh, BIM management process with AGC. Um, that really helps kind of give credentials to those people that are involved in, in the BIM projects. Um, virtual reality, I've been using that myself on a couple projects I'm involved with out in California. Um, especially with COVID, we've had, we had coordination meetings planned for our models to bring people in and, and kind of show them what the new, you know, this was a water treatment plant that we were dealing with. Um, how it's going to look. But what we ended up doing was after COVID is we created uh, virtual reality models. And in this case, we used an Iris VR. And we would have virtual sessions with uh, the guys that were going to be doing maintenance work in this facility. And we would show them, you know, walk them through this thing and say, is this where you want this about? Is this a good place to put this, you know, control panel and stuff? Um, and a lot of those guys, there, and again, they were, you know, eyes open again. Uh, they were like, well, we never got that question asked until it was built. Usually they would go into a facility and say, I don't want that out there, or this is a stupid place to put a you know, control panel. Uh, so getting those guys involved in that whole process, we could take care of that stuff before we got out of the building and made all that a reality. Uh, we take care of all the 4D, 5D, 6D, uh, you name it. We, we try to help. Uh, if the project doesn't already have something in place, we'll try and, and either find the right person or we'll do it ourselves, uh, put those models together so that we can help kind of uh, track our costs, track our schedules. Um, we even, even up to the, the 60 uh, models, we'll have all the, the, the item numbers, the costs that are available for those, what kind of filters, you know, the, the owner's going to need to replace once the place is built, things like that. Uh, here recently, we've been getting into 3D printing. Um, I think initially it was kind of a novelty. Uh, if you can imagine a, like a gas power plant, it looks pretty innocuous when you walk and drive by on the highway, but there's a lot of detail in that. And one client that wanted a 3D model of their plant, it literally took one guy, I think he had two machines running for three months straight, just printing all the pieces and all the, we had to figure out how to, how to print pipes of all things, that, you know, at a certain scale, and putting all that together, and I mean, it's, it was like one of those old Revell models that you put together when you were a kid. Um, but a lot of that stuff, it seemed like a novelty when they asked for it, but they've actually since then asked for a second one because they have all our facilities management people involved now where they can, you know, if they're going to do work in a certain area, the safety guys can come out and plan their, plan their day around this model where they're going to, you know, where they need to make sure that people are clear of an area because of chemical hazards, things like that. Um, so we, we've seen a lot of benefit to have three models available for that. Um, and a lot of what our BIM services do, this goes with kind of like my, my background with the CAT support, is doing product research and development. So, you know, like we, we talked about kind of being product agnostic, but we, we have, if you name a product like Revisto or any of those ones that, that we use, it's one of our districts probably uses it. And it's one of those things that, that we've, you know, it's one product isn't the answer to everything that your company does. There might be different tools for different districts, even different disciplines. Um, a lot of our construction guys would have no use for Revisto, but all of our design guys for MEP and things like that, that's, that's a must have. So it's, it's things like that that we try to do a little bit, a little bit of R&D up front so we know where those products fit, where they don't, and so we're not wasting money on, 
things we like to use. Um, this graphic I've been using for a while, um, and that, this is what I kind of use to, to sell the product to our clients and our owners. Um, why do we need them services? And if you look at the whole life cycle of the building, no matter what you're building, if it's a house, power command, anything like that, it all takes on this whole life cycle. Um, if you're starting from a new green field, um, you're starting a brand new building, it's, you're going through all the documentation, fabrication, construction, um, that building is going to have a life of its own. And then by the time it's life expectancy is done, you're back to demolition and you're starting another project. So this whole BIM services kind of incorporates every aspect of what this means and what construction is and how you're going to do your job, do it efficiently, make money, and, and make a building or make a product that's going to last. Um, a lot, of, a lot of times, a lot of the buildings you see, that, and I'm thinking about the one in San Francisco that's been tipped for years. Um, you know, you think about how how the foundations were done on that building, and if they would have had, you know, something like, you know, some pre-planning like them services, maybe that wouldn't happen. Um, they just kind of went through the whole, you know, design and construction thing all at the same time. Um, but now they're going back, they're actually using models of that building of the foundation that they have to go back and scan and stuff trying to figure out a way to fix it. But again, that's all part of their services. And one thing, especially in, in and I think this works in, in any company, if you're trying to sell why your company needs them services, these are these are probably the highlighted uh, ideas for it. Our number one thing for a key whip is safety. Uh, we self perform a lot of our own work. We actually have the largest private construction fleet in the nation. Um, so when you talk about having 10,000 plus people working for you doing construction, you don't want anybody getting hurt. So safety coordination is a huge thing for us. Um, we like to use the models for things like that too, to kind of help promote our safety environment. Um, having models that are that are data centric, having all the, the information that's up front that's there helps minimize a lot of the, the delays in our schedules. Um, a lot of the model quality, if you get everybody on the same page, your model quality improves eventually, which you know, get feedback from different groups. Um, the data consumption, I, I already alluded to that, we've got, we actually hire people that are just data savants that pull this information out of our models that are already there and, and figure out new ways to, to develop it or use that data. Um, we've actually, and one of the, it's kind of an afterthought, but one of the big things that have happened with some of the projects we've been using is we've had fewer issues during construction. Um, there's a lot of things that we coordinated in the office before we even you know, put a shovel on the ground. Um, a lot of that stuff is done beforehand and it, just, it makes for uh, you know, a lot smoother projects, more money obviously, better time spent doing other things instead of messing, you know, rework and things like that. Um, a lot of the, the deals we talk about with our coordination meetings is just to help improve important communication. Um, communication is probably the key when you're in the design phase and if you're like us, we have construction guys out in the field that are, you know, they might be waiting on us to give them information on a building or something that we're putting out. Or if there is an issue, we can use a model coordinated for them. Uh, but that communication has to be nonstop. Uh, it has to be very well coordinated for anything to improve. And ultimately, you get happy clients with that. Uh, a lot of our clients that, that we serve are you know, big utilities. Um, I'm trying to think some other companies and things that we do that are outside of my power plant purview, but um, a lot of our clients, they're, they're impressed with the data they get, they're impressed with the product they get from whatever we've built, um, but they'll come back time and again. They, they'll use Keywit as kind of a litmus test for a lot of other you know, people that are bidding on their work and stuff based on what we've done in the past with our modeling. Now this whole process has not gone without any bumps in the road, and I guarantee yours won't either. Uh, participation is the key. There are so many people, and I was probably one of them initially, that, you know, why do we need this information? Why do we need it? We're just going to go out and build it. We've got construction guys that have been out there for 30 some years. I don't need that. I know where my bulldozer is going to go. You know, I know what I need. I need this type of crane, things like that. They already know that off the top of their head. Well, when those guys retire or, you know, go away, then what are you left with? You're left with somebody, oh, I thought he said, a long time ago that this crane would fit here, but now it doesn't. Well, we actually use our models for that type of collaboration. We'll tell them, you know, you have so many, so much lay down area to park, eight, you know, D9 dozer or something. We, we 
we use those models to help coordinate with construction on what they're going to do out in the field. Um, Cross-district collaboration is kind of a big one. I know everybody talks about silos. Um, our group, our companies, probably guilty as that as anybody. We just have so many different variables. They're all different districts that they're all kind of doing their own thing. Um, that's fine to a, certain, to a point, but you kind of want that collaboration to evolve, uh, get more people involved and stuff like that. So, you know, whatever Denver's doing, Kansas City, if, if Denver's doing something that's going gangbusters, it's really working, we want people in Kansas City to hear about it because we want that improvement to kind of, you know, flow throughout the company and, and figure out things that, you know, that we've had to talk over in the past. Um, one of the other lessons we had was, uh, I would say a big one here, is limited internal capabilities. Um, we have some people that will call themselves a VIM manager, and it turns out that they're, they know rep, they know how to spell rep. That's, that's about it. So we try to get those people plugged in. Uh, you know, that, that obviously if they know that, they've got a, a decent foundation for modeling, things like that, but we want to help them improve as well. So we'll, we'll pull them through our VIM meetings, uh, coordination, we'll get them the training they need, things like that. Um, just to try and help, you know, elevate some of the people that we've already got to have that uh, that resource in the future. So that's about it for us. We'll get some good questions like this.
Sure, and just a, just a point of clarification, and then I'll repeat the question. Was that buy-in from owners or buy-in from GC, sir? From everyone. From everybody. Okay. All right. So, you good. know, you look at a contractor, and it's different. You look at an owner. A real estate agent. I got an address. Right. I love the question. Okay. So, um, so the gentleman's question was, uh, uh, the bid process can be so simplified, um, uh, but how do we make sure that we're getting the, uh, every single stakeholder along the entire construction process to get them to buy into the process, not just oversimplify it, but how do we make sure that we can, we can explain to, to that individual stakeholder why the bid process is important? Would you, uh, was that a, a reasonable? Yeah, I, I believe so. It's just that BIM's been around so long, early days, you know, somebody had that terminology, mm -hmm. but it's grown. So. Right, right, right. Yeah, how do we restate, redefine BIM to the, to the direct stakeholders, to the represented stakeholders? Um, I, I imagine, for, um, in, in, you know, your, your company, you, you have to deal with many, many different districts, for example, so there's many different people you have to get buy-in from just within your company. Yeah, I, I think to address your question, right, you, you asked about that, I think for us, the big thing is the BIM execution plan. It has to be very clear on who's responsible for what, um, when the deliverables are, what they're delivering, what LOD they're delivering. Um, all that stuff has to be set up front. And I know the BIM execution plan can get very long, very complicated, but like I said, BIM is a very simple idea. So getting people plugged into that idea, letting them know that this is your responsibility, this is what I need from you, this is when I need it, that has to be made very clear from the beginning for everybody, for everybody to have that, that buy-in. Yeah, I was going to say the, uh, the BIM execution plan. When I looked at the, what we had, it was probably 10 years old. It's probably 30 pages. I threw it out right away. I just like, if the owner can't read the first page, why give them 30? So we did more of an exhibit type. You know, BIM is probably uh, just the guidelines, a two page article. Then their LOD is you know, obviously more intensive. But um, that's been the best. Well, actually, we had to rewrite some of our contracts too, even with our subs. That's interesting. Because you know? the whole language of do you do that, what does that even mean? So we have to actually go back and rewrite our contracts. So. I do like seeing uh, the, I see a lot of BIM implementation plans in there. Usually those are like a single page document that clearly states what each trade is responsible for. Then there's a few more pages of detail, but uh, most people who are familiar with the process so far understand really quickly what's going to be expected, just whether or not there are as built required, or you know all those different components. Um, and then the contracting is a really big issue. Um, on the way we interact with projects, typically we're remodeling things that are already modeled, which I think is just I hate doing things twice. Uh, so the civil engineers potentially modeling it, and then you put the contract states that you cannot utilize that model for anything, so you're forced to recreate it from the two-dimensional two models. Just as an example, there's a kind of a lot of Wonderful, thank you for the, thank you for the, uh, the, uh, the detail there. Um, definitely a lot of focus on the BIM execution plan and the contract, and, and when we look at it, the stakeholders there, are the, uh, at least traditionally, the stakeholders are the folks that are executing on the BIM execution plan or potentially have an immediate dependency on the BIM execution plan, uh, but maybe not the real estate agent doesn't have any insight into the BIM execution plan or the owner. So what are, um, what are our thoughts on, on expanding the audience or trying to get a broader uh, feedback uh, loop engaged for the, you know, the end of cycle, the facilities team, the real estate team, the uh, uh, owners of the, of the world? Um, because I, uh, of the BIM execution plans that, that I've been a part of, um, Primarily, it's, it's, it's a core focus team, um, and, and it may not include them in this conference about facilities management and how important it is to take that BIM model and go all the way to facilities management. Do you think that's um, do you think that's something the general contractor uh, is is, re is ultimately responsible for making sure that there's a strong stakeholder alignment? Or what are, you, what are your thoughts on you know looking at everybody in the system? I think a lot of it has to do with the, the data that's presented or how it's being formatted. Because like I said, we got I know my Previous life before Keyman, we worked with a lot of DCs and a lot of researchers. And they, they had all the model data that they wanted, but they didn't really know what they had. So, in order for us to relay that, we had to kind of either format the data, you know, like for a realtor, they want to know.
about square footage of lots or you know how many apartments they could put on in this block or something like that. Um, we had to figure out where that day was at and how to present it best so they could consume it, um, even though it was there. But yeah, that was that was kind of how we kept it all that. Thanks. And then like that the GC side, it's tough because when we get the design model, you have to redo the whole entire thing. So it's even then, that's really why the FM really dies on our side as a GC. We don't want to even bring it up. It's such a labor intensive task. Go back and change the model. It really should have been done early on. The owner and the architect should have sat down and set that guideline very early on. And that's the only way it's going to move forward in this world. Those GCs just don't have the time to properly everything in that model. Sometimes I have seen that really work well. The developer is also going to be the ultimate owner, right? Um, if they know they're going to be operating that building, then there's a much higher chance of being able to utilize that data. But if they're going to offload it to someone else, they don't know. It's going to be worth the effort to that potential buyer. Wonderful. So what I gathered is it's, 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 it's incumbent upon all of us to, to gather the data and represent it in a way that's digestible. And then it's incumbent on us to ask for the right stakeholders in that room, ask for the owner, ask for the developer to be in that room. And I think that's something that's a muscle that we're not quite used to flexing is to say, hey, as, as the GC or as the contractor or as the subcontractor, we want the owner to be here in the room. That's almost the, you know, the, the person that's always kept outside the room of the discussion. But I think the more that we encourage that the owner be present with us, especially in the planning process, I think the more successful that could be. All right, wonderful. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Um, Good morning. You guys talk about collaboration and collaboration and collaboration and reformatting Guide them how they're doing their work. 
Um, once we get into the actual construction and you know hammers on nails, um, we have tablets or even phones that um, we utilize. Uh, my projects out in California utilize within 360. Um, as we're posting models up, the guys out in the field can download them on their phones or tablets, and they have they can do all the measurements they need or you know, figure out what they're. Um, we also load up work packages for that, so they they'll tell us, hey, we've got a five-man crew next week ready to do something, so we'll set up a, a work pack for at least the coordinators and the guys that are working on the schedule will develop a work pack that they're working in this area of the project, you know, installing this pipe or this like, panel or whatever. So we use a lot of that stuff all the way in the system. Awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think you've, yeah, that was the first point. You've been waiting a while. Oh, OK, sorry. Yeah. Thank you, sir. You're out of my head. So, yeah, no, that's right there. No, no, no. Any questions? So, in my experience, Um, we 
there's different methods for doing estimating, but at least for our experience, what we found the most beneficial is actually to start a brand new model um, and actually do a full blown model. I mean, everything we can possibly, we'll have some cookie cutter things, like for our power plants, we'll have our standard generators and you know all the different components that make up a power plant, but we customize those for the site that we're designing for, um, the, the megawatts or whatever the customer is asking for. Um, we'll do what they call it a grounds up estimate that we go through everything. Um, we end up usually you know, getting construction involved in that to kind of get their two cents in on you know if this configuration will work, if they have you know, resources in that region of the country to, to gear up for it, what's going to cost, and mobilize, things like that. But, yeah, we, we do it from the ground up. Uh, it's the model that we end up with will be a BIM model. Some some projects we'll actually take our estimate model and that'll be our foundation for a project that we start from scratch. And like I said, having having even though they are a cookie cutter, we might have a, a generator like a, a GE generator for a power plant. Uh, it's it's a standard model, but it's got all the logistics and the costs and everything that it costs to in, implement that and build it, ship it, uh, fire it up, all that stuff. So all in that all that information is in that group. That we have from the estimate, so that's kind of built into the foundation. We have noticed a trend uh, with our clients this year, particularly that they're starting to build maybe an LOE kind of 100, 200 version of the model during the estimate cycle to help them even have a little bit more accuracy, and then they want to hand that off to the to their team, to the LOE 400 team. Um, but you know, eventually, ideal would be uh, would be having that model way before you estimate the full project. So I'm curious, what do we think, where do we see the industry going and, and accelerating or, or bringing much you know, forward much further into the schedule, um, the entire the, the pre-construction process? Yeah, I, I think that's that's kind of what you alluded to. When, when I came on board with Keywood, I mean, it's, things are still in flux right now, but like, we did the same thing. We did like a level 4 or 200 uh, model, and then when the estimate was over, that model was going. And we got thinking, okay, you, got, you guys put a lot of hours, a lot of estimates, a lot of work into this model. Why are we just trashing it? So we we have figured out ways to improve our estimating group and to you know to improve the, the BIM effort in that in the estimating group um, to where we can take the models and at least have a foundation and move forward and we're not wasting all that time and all that effort. Okay. Thank you, thank you for the question. All right, uh, yeah, we'll go up front we'll work backwards. Yes, sir. So I'm going to transition. Groups and then they get to other subs 
So that helps speed that process along. Because before it was a lot of third party, you would third, hey, talk to this reseller, they have someone to help you. By the time they train them and implement some type of template, it's just gonna take forever. So I definitely do champion, get involved in your local market. Like, you know, Atlanta's got a really great group where it's a been leadership group. You know, each office, you know, should have, or each, sorry, each town, city, should have a local group like that and really go beyond just your local VDC group and folks. Get down to the detail level. Well, and in, in my previous life, I had that exact same experience. I worked with a smaller bid coordination firm, and DCs would hire us because they were part of the contract said they only bid. So they would hire us because we knew BIM, but a lot of the communication was, you know, DC just told us to go out, do BIM, do what you do, and, you know, give us your product. But what we tried to do as a smaller firm is we tried to educate them on what they were getting. So, hey, we did go out and scan this, and actually one of my friends is still involved in that. He actually did some scanning in, in the basement of the DIA. Um, and so what he would do is go out and do the scans, do all his replication, do all those things that he needed to do, and then when he handed over the model, he would explain what he was giving them, you know, where the dimensions were, and how it fit in their overall plan for their remodel, things like that. So uh, the big thing of that was just communication. Yes, sir. Understanding that the mapping and survey work is your initial step. Is there any kind of document that I can go find for them to define what those standards and accuracy requirements are for your project? Uh, so just to make sure I, I rephrase and understand correctly, so you're coming from the mapping and uh, imaging side or the mapping and surveying side and you'd like to understand how, how can you better fit into the BIM processes and what, what I standards think are there? I think it's like the here, so yeah. I can go and review that to understand what the requirements, specifications, and accuracies are for that initial step. Right, what, what documents are out there to help you feed into that, feed into that process? Um, uh, I'm aware of some standards bodies that are out there that are forming. Um, uh, Saul Lackard is on, is on one, for example, and she's providing the keynote this afternoon. Um, so that's a great question that we can bring to Saul as well. But, gentlemen, are you aware of uh, sort of public facing information that would help the mapping and surveying crews um, uh, tie in better with the BIM team? Well, as far as project specific, I would say the, the BIM execution plan may have some control information and, and allude to what the there's usually a section that will tell you uh, the aspirations for using them on the project. So that will help give you an idea of what type of reality capture would be best utilized. But then as far as um, there's the ASPRS, which is a geospatial, uh, uh, it's a governing body for geospatial work, accuracy and density points, things like that for LIDAR. And US IBD has their LLA, which is uh, level of accuracy. So there's different levels, just like there's different levels of BIM, there's different levels of accuracy in development. Yeah, we've uh, been using what's called a layout execution plan. That's more specific to the survey side. And that really sets our guidelines of, okay, what type of silver file we're getting, how we get that. Um, it helps a little bit. But there's really not been something to be referenced that has to be X, Y, and Z, honestly. But you should ask for it. Yeah, you should. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. I haven't heard of the layout execution plan yet, so maybe there's a template that's, that's out there, or at least in our community, we can, we can surface it. Yeah, especially because of how we digest that file, because if we're doing our own self layout, we need to that kind of work out according to you know, what's the benchmarking, and obviously, you know, is it going to be in a 3D civil file versus a 2D file? It's a big difference, obviously. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. So, for the construction of the period process, do you notice the decline or reduction of the CPE or SPD that is being calculated in the construction of the so are we, um, in construction procurement, are we able to measure risk or, or de-risk based on the model? Is that the yeah. And how does that affect the price? Uh, and and how, does, how does the model help de-risk or help affect the price? Beautiful. Uh, so I've recently had one. Uh, this is the director of Form Work. And they, they, like, they have layout galleries, but they don't have a layout for it. So it's, 
we took on that risk, we had to do it. Uh, but I did, I did propose the outsourcing of it, but the amount of money in our market, I couldn't say no to that amount of money, because $200,000, we couldn't do that. So now I'm actually seeing a lot of the other concrete um, groups, their detailers are very young, not novice, using the models. So we're trying to actually elevate them. And actually, I, I proposed recently too that we'll do your shop drawings because we're faster and better to use tools where they don't really have an Autodesk type package. Um, they're so small. Um, so I'm starting, I'm starting to see them a little bit, put that money into the beginning for detailing and layout. And we're actually buying it out uh, for internally. In our experience, we've actually had uh, some of our procurement, some of the items that we're um, working into our model dictate how we're developing that model. Um, we had one of our projects out in California that I was talking about. Um, one project had 50 some certain specific tanks, they were specialized tanks that had been designed. Uh, the whole design process was going to last less than a year before they started construction. So we had to base when those tanks could be you know, built and delivered back into our models so we knew which area to plan to do our stub ups and foundations first. Otherwise we would have been way behind the curve and you know the, the tanks might not even have been done by the time we started construction. So a lot of that procurement you're talking about, um, you know, we knew what the cost was up front, but that kind of drove our schedule and our modeling efforts based on what we what we buy. That sounds like a great great application of the BIM 4D process. So yeah. having time and schedule into that it's beautiful. Yeah, I love to see that in action. Wonderful. Uh, uh, let's go this gentleman and then we'll come back to you. Thank you, Cameron. We heard great information about the food services during and or pre and during construction. And then, you know, going to the, the vendors and we did it all, a lot of exciting technology, you know, wearable scanning devices and LIDAR and imagery and all that stuff. And I'm thinking, you know, looking good at it. Technologies going and provide a talk on business services with like existing structures. You know, where do you see that going in the part of the gap? Well, so, um, so how do we how do we not only address new construction and, and managing them and with the new technology that's coming out with wearables, but how do we also address tenant improvement construction with new technology? Uh, uh, well, being on the land surveying side, there's definitely Really, we like to supplement the traditional land surveying, which is kind of a more of a two-dimensional plan and um, just line work that is intended to be printed out in 2D, and supplementing that with you know getting existing conditions that are typically via lidar now. Those can be converted easily into 3D BIM geometry. Um, there's a, there's a lot of for like building fit outs, the, there's, there's a lot of existing laser scanning to bend, scan to bend, it's referred to. Uh, that's been pretty well documented ever since laser scanners became, had good ROI. Um, and there's just more and more sensors and, and, and uh, vehicles that can get into places that they wouldn't have been able to before. So, Tunnel, like tight spaces where you don't want to put people in tunnels or underground or caves and, and mining and things like that. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity in the existing. And then there's a lot of technology sensors for picking up underground utilities that didn't exist before with GPR and things like that. And I can go straight to a 3D model where it been before. I'll make some of that, I think, is where, where we're at now. Yeah, I think uh, I'm, I'm also trying to figure out how we pay for stuff. And it's been interesting because on the architecture side, and the owner side, the architecture groups don't really have an understanding. Uh, they might know someone of it. So if we start early on, I'm able to say, hey, we can do an ASMO, we'll scan it, we'll actually model the existing structure, which they prefer anyways. Um, but the amount of money that we normally get from that task is a lot more than we would on the coordination and actually the BIM effort. Um, and that, that's, that's a great revenue stream to keep us paying for R&D and other technology as well. And in, in my experience, and again, this is prior to Keywood, um, one project I'm thinking that, that would line right up with your question was we did a, 
uh, Swarthy Yale University. They had some buildings that were built back in the 1800s, and all their plans are on parchment paper, basically. Um, they didn't have any kind of modeling or any other. They knew they needed some upgrades and some structural efficiencies, but they didn't know where they were. Um, so we had crews that actually went in and scanned that thing by hand, inside and out, and we modeled everything, and basically showed them where they had the space to put new HVAC or, or where they needed to, you know, they sell for structural efficiencies, but um, now those 1800, the old 1800 model buildings have an actual model for them. They're, they're all, you know, I won't say up to date, but uh, there's something useful there, and that was just by going in and scanning it. That was something they didn't have before. It's an amazing project. Thank you for sharing that one. Um, can I get a show of hands of questions and then I'll do a time check? So we have um, two, I think, uh, three? three. Okay. Cool. So we'll take these We'll take these three questions and then a, a quick time check and then I, uh, we'll, we'll break out into the quadrants uh, if you want to If you want to sort of follow up individually with, with anyone. Um, does that sound good? So we'll go front to back. Yes, ma'am? So, Captain, what are some of the things that you have learned with the new data and how you sort of practice? Have we learned uh, with the data that we're collecting? Have we, have we been able to learn and course correct from that data? Yeah, there's, I, I think there's probably too many examples to, to iterate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've, it's been interesting, and especially with Keywit, we're such a big organization. We've got a lot of different, you know, feet in the water doing different things. Uh, but a lot of the data that we've that we've found that that were already in our models that you know maybe our construction counterparts weren't aware of. Um, you know, it, it, I want to think one of the, probably the little things, it doesn't seem little, but it was just the coordination itself. I mean, we, we've had, and I alluded to, you know, the construction guys that have been there for 30 years, they knew exactly where they would place their equipment and all that stuff before they got out on site. But once we got the model developed and we had more detail on certain sites, we would help them, you know, make better decisions on things like that, of, of logistics. And uh, with our construction fleet, we have them spread out all over the nation. So whether they needed a certain type of crane that maybe we only had two of, they needed on this side of the country or that side, you know, maybe we use the model to determine, okay, well maybe we have another one in our inventory that would work better here. Um, before they might have shipped that thing all the way across the country and decided that oh dang it's too big for that project. So using that data we've made better decisions up front than we would have otherwise. I think, but I, I, I said back to front, but of course I, I did start at the front, so <laughs> very quick to back. Um, uh, and then uh, we'll do a popcorn, so maybe just one, one you know, uh, if you guys want to raise your hand, if you want to take the question, we'll do one, one answer. Yes, sir. Um,